We've been looking to the message of uh, Revelation. We are part seven already. So, wow, times go so fast. And I started with uh, talking some of the churches. And actually, it's kind of the fourth, fourth church because uh, one previous message, though it was not all dedicated, we discussed like the, the, the lack of our emotions. It was from the book of, to the Ephesians. And uh, here, uh, we last uh, two weeks ago, we talked about Smyrna, the poor church that Jesus considered as being a rich church. And last week we talked about the foolish church, Laodicea, who says, I am rich. And Jesus says, you are poor, you are blind, you are miserable. So, you know, all of this is reminding us that we should not look at churches based on buildings based on material, whether they have a large building, a moderate building, a hut or on, under a tree or some, some kind of things. It doesn't matter. This is not the, the things, how many programs and activities. This message that Jesus Christ is giving to his seven churches before, and you need to, to realize the, the timing of all of this. This message is a picture of our modern church today. We need that message before the judgments, before tribulation will come, before the wrath of God is coming into this world. He is giving us a chance. This is a message of mercy. This is a warning. He loves us. Even though we look at these churches and many of them have lots of problems. He loves us so much that He is correcting these problems. He's telling us that He sees the problem, that He knows the problems. And He is tending His, his, his hand and He is telling us everything. We need to do the steps. So today we want to look at some of the steps, uh, look, looking about true spiritual life, God's formula for renewal and revival. How can we be revived? Because this is what Jesus wants us to be when He comes. Will we be ready? Amen? Are you ready? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about it. Am I really ready? You know something? Maybe you will know more toward the end of the message today. Hallelujah. You know, the message of Jesus addresses that he addressed to his church is a picture of our age. You know, today we live in luxury. We live in comfort in many, many areas of this world, lack even the simple message of the gospel. We give our best of our life to our business world. Look at every nicest building in this world. Bank of this, bank of that, bank of America, bank of China, bank of this and that. We give the best of our society to the business world. And you know what we give to Jesus Christ? The leftovers, our failures. Like when we are falling apart. Oh Lord, I give myself to you. If you lift me up, oh God, I will follow you. You know, but we've already destroyed and messed up everything. So this is again grace. This is grace after grace, outpouring of grace. Our God is so gracious, He's so compassionate, and He is so merciful. The Lord Jesus loves His church. He loves His church. He gave His life. Have you ever given your life for something? Mm, no, you're still here, huh? You haven't given it at Maybe you've given some part of your life and your energy and your, your money or whatever, your talents, but Jesus gave it all for us. Amen. And you know, this is another proof that the plan of God is to prepare His church before the rapture. Because after the message is finished in chapter 3, chapter 4 begins, come up here and there's no more mention of churches. After that, in the book of Revelation, after that, it is God's wrath on this world. He's settling his account with the evil, with the wickedness, with the rebellion of the, of the human being for time and time and time. Through thousands of years, he is settling his account and he is going to bring a new world order after this. So before all of this happens, he is just making sure that we are ready. And this is a very serious message, and this is a very uh, relevant uh, and important message to all of us.
So we will learn about true spiritual life today. There was a pastor, I was reading a, a, a bit of a story that he's telling. He went to an old church, he was invited to, to preach. And um, he's, decri he's describing the church as a very, very uh, high ceiling, big, huge, enormous pipe organ and the auditorium. The church could sit 800 people, but there were about 35 people instead. And most of them were well above 60, 70. Or the choirs were 80 years old, eight ladies of 80 years old. And the, the organ player actually had been, had been uh, hired to play the organ because he didn't have anybody to play and he was in the most sexual. And at the end of, the, of his playing the organ, he just le left. He was, he's not attending the church. He's just going to do his job. He's being paid. So the preacher was in this church looking at his environment and he was uh, quite disturbed about this. He says, as I waited for my time to preach, I was aware of the life of the city outside. Outside there's, there's life, there's activities. And also I, he was aware that people totally were unaware of this church and untouched by this church. Like there's life outside this church, but the people outside the church don't even see or recognize that there is a church, that the church has a message, that the church has something to touch them. And he says, every, every, every time I read the church of Sardis, I think about this congregation. So today we are going to talk about the church of, of Sardis, the feeble church or the lifeless church. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1 to 6. And to the angel of the church and Sardis write, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up! And strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time, what hour I will come against you. When Jesus spoke these words, the ancient city of Sardis uh, was already in the decline. It has been a very prosperous city, known for its immorality, for its softness, for its luxuries, and all of this. But at that time, it was already declined. The Lord presented himself as the one who has the seven spirits of God. And the seven, uh, the seven stars are, are the churches. So he has the power to enlighten, to make alive, to produce power for all of his church and they are in his hand. So he has all authority, all power. Men's made programs, activities, uh, buildings, and all of this cannot bring life, spiritual life to a church. The church was born, and this we need to be reminded of that all the time for, for our gathering every Sundays. The church was born on Pentecost. The church was born by the Holy Spirit, and the church is producing spiritual life by the Holy Spirit. And this message, well, that's why Jesus identified himself to a lifeless church as being the one who has the seven spirits. That's about the spirit. This church is about the spirit. It is about the, the ten virgins, the five wise and the five foolish. S five of them had oil and five of them didn't have oil. And the five who didn't have oil went away when it was the time. They didn't know the time that the Lord came, that the Master came for the wedding. And they missed, they missed, they missed the opportunities. And when they came, they knocked at the door and said, we don't, I don't know you. The door is closed already. It's too late. You missed the timing of God, the revelation of God. He came as a thief. This is exactly what we see. The ch any church, a church relies on the power of the Holy Spirit, its guidance, uh, everything that He is and can do for us. So that's why the Lord is confronting the spiritual condition of that church. If you would look at the church of Sardis, you would think that this is a normal church. 
you know, because as you have the reputation of. So it's not like it was dying, like the, the church that I was uh, uh, talking about before, you know. Uh, if you would look at the church, you know, you would visit on the Sunday morning, you would say, this is a normal church. They sing the songs, they have a pianist, they have an offering, uh, they have a message, they have everything. So from the outside, you have the reputation of being alive. But Jesus Christ, who knows with his, you know, fiery uh, eyes that uh, he described himself, he knows and he pierced through this, what is the, the reality of, of a church life and everything. So he says, you have a reputation of a Christian assemblies, but you are a lifeless uh, church. Reputation is not a guarantee. You know, people can think, oh, this church is cool, this church is lively, this church is this, uh, this concert, this ministry, this, this, this. Reputation is no guarantee because the Lord sees things uh, differently. This church has no words of commendation. This is another church that has nothing positive to say about this church from the Lord. Outsiders in the church of Sardis would probably ignore the existence of this church. This was a decent church, probably, in terms of human, I mean, there's nice people there. They are nice people. They, they, they are polite, they are, you know, they are there. But in terms of spiritual impact in their society, there is none. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Christian can go on for a while based on Christian activities. We, anybody can do Christian activities. You can do Christian activities. Um, but you cannot measure today's spir spirituality based on past achievement. Your spiritual life must be renewed. You know, you may have been a very active Christian 10 years ago or 20 years ago. You may have been on a mission trip five years ago. You may have been used by God to pray for a person sick and the person has recovered. You may have had that experience behind you. Does that make you alive today? No, not necessarily. You need to be renewed. You need to be always uh, in touch with Jesus Christ. Dr. William Barclay says, a church is in danger of that when it begins to worship its own past. When you talk about the past, when you talk about the past or, or foundation or in, uh, in the old days. 20 years ago, we used to do this. 20 years ago, this is the way that we used to do. We have I've always done things in this way in this church. Well, be, let's be careful about that. What makes your life, my life, become spiritual? Uh, what elevates me and you from... The, 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 the reality or the realm of my own human abilities, my own impossibilities. What can make me elevate above my own ability and limitations? We know that this is Jesus who has the seven spirit, the, the fullness of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that gives life to the church. And this is what the church of Sardis needed. The Holy Spirit, you know that, I'm just saying things that everybody in this church knows already. The Holy Spirit causes us to be reborn. Without that, there is no life of God. So that's the beginning. The Holy Spirit starts, initiates, brings it to be possible to be reborn. The Holy Spirit fills us. The Holy Spirit leads us to Jesus. He makes it possible for us to connect with Jesus. You know, we have a body, soul, and spirit, or soul, we explained it in the past, our soul connects with the world. Our soul connects with the emotions of another person, with our intellect, with our will, with buying, selling, fear, emotion, positive, negative, knowing people, knowing our environment. We are able to live in this world as we know it because we have a soul, an intelligence, ability to make decisions and analyze things and respond to this world. But the spirit 
of man has been created so to connect with God. But when we are not born again, this connection is not possible. There is a wall because of sin. And God is on the other side of the wall. But when we believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in this spirit of man. And the life of God comes active and then the process of transformation, rebirth, and then sanctification begins. I have a list of uh, scriptures quickly to look at about the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14, 20. I just put some, some of them. The next, it's not there? Oh, I'm so sorry, I forgot to put it there. Okay, let me just go quickly over that. John 14, 20, and that day you will know that I am in my Father, you and me, and, you, and I in you. Verse 26, he will teach you and bring to, you, to your remembrance everything that I have said to you. He will bear witness about me, Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Uh, chapter 16, he will guide you into all truth. He will declare you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. Jesus, and he will take what is mine and declare it to you or show you the things. So all this connection between Jesus Christ and the church and you is done by the Holy Spirit. So that's very important. You know, in Romans 8.13, we read that through the Holy Spirit, we can put to death the, the deeds of the flesh, like all the carnal nature, the jealousy, the anger, uh, all, everything that is ugly in the face of God, everything that is, belongs to the sinful nature. We can put it to death by the power of the Holy Spirit, and if we do so, we will live. But if we don't, then we will die. And this is exactly what we're talking. We're talking about dying or about being alive. And this is what we do. We can pray by the Spirit or in the Spirit. We can conduct our life and our business by the Spirit. We know and we declare that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. How many agrees with that? Amen. Okay? We all agree with that. Here, nobody will ever dare to, to disagree with this. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. But how is He to really be the head of our church? How is it possible that Jesus Christ is in reality the head of this church? The Holy Spirit. If we are communicating with Him through the Holy Spirit, if we receive revelation, He says, He will take what is mine and show it to you. He will re remember you. He will give, to bring to your remembrance. He will connect you. This day you will know that I am in you and you and me. So there's this connection. The Holy Spirit is. Without this renewed uh, relationship, feeling, renewing of the Holy Spirit, then we will decline like the city of, and the church of Sardis. You know, this week, the board and the, the pastors, we met in view of the annual general meeting next week. Lighthouse belongs to Jesus. Is Jesus the head of Lighthouse? Yes. So what do we do when we meet? We seek the will of the one who is the head of the church. We pray. We want to do what is pleasing to him, what is beneficial so that this church will not die, that this church will be renewed, will be uh, doing the things that are pleasing to the Lord. So would you specifically pray like Pastor Jennifer asked this week for next week? Oh, annual general meeting, we have that every, 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 every year. It's, it's only business. No, no, it's more than that. It's about our life. It's about decisions. It's about governing. It's about directions. It's about wh what concerns all of us. It's important. The, we need to pray. We cannot just come and sit uh, to, to the, the uh, annual general meeting. This is missing the goal. Everything that we do in this church should be done with the mind of Christ. We should have something inside of us. As this is important. This is between us and Jesus Christ. If we lose that, anything becomes just material, politics. We can agree, disagree, criticize, discuss, uh, uh, you know, dispute, everything. 
That's why many churches have uh, a lot of divisions over annual general meeting, over finance. You know, like the, the, the few years when we did the renovation, I know churches who divided themselves over renovation and construction project. Pastors have been fired. You know, and pastors have been taken to court by, by, by an angry court. When it's time, ugly things can happen. I was in a church meeting one time, and the people, not, that, in, Hong not in Hong Kong, and Canada, long, 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 long time ago. I was, I was a, a pastor there, an assistant pastor. And there was a division, and the, the board of leaders of the denomination came, and there was a discussion, and... Finally, a decision was made, and those who were not happy with the decision, you know what they did? They shouted, they walked to the door, they switched off the light, and some of them even swore. That's how that meeting ended. You know, like, we all look so cool here in this church. You all look so submissive to the Holy Spirit, filled with love and everything, but oh... If something touch you in the flesh, oh, that can explode. And something different, that's something that we have never seen here. We have this potential in each one of us, you know, to say ugly things, things that we regret, to do things that should not be done. Even think about something like that. This is all the potential of the human nature. If the Holy Spirit does not dominate this, if there is not a continual flow, like a, a, a rivers of water, but we become a stagnant pond. You know, like the, like the, the, the well that we have seen with all the, gra the, the green, you know, the, the larvas and, and everything, all the poisonous things. We can become like this, a church of poison, poisonous mouth, poisonous attitudes and everything. But the flow of the Holy Spirit needs to, you know, refresh and fill and change and you know bring us always into the action of the Lord Jesus what does a dead, dead church need in, in our text the Lord is telling us very clearly the first thing is very simple very direct the Lord is wake up wake up a dead church needs to wake up that's what the Lord says and strengthen what remains is about to die the Lord called the church to revive to revive ourselves and with little life that remains. You know, I was looking at revive and all of this, and Mr. Spurgeon, great preacher, uh, explained the word revive from the Latin. Receive again a life which has almost expired. That's revive. To, to receive a life that is almost no more, okay? And then he continued to rekindle into a flame the vital spark that was nearly extinguished. To rekindle that little, you know, flame on the candle. Okay. And an illustration of that is when a person is drowning in a river and he's being taken out, then the people around, they are wondering, is, is, he, is he still alive? Is he dead? Then there are like, witnesses around. Then someone will try to reanimate, uh, reanimate that person. And if by God's grace there is still life, the man will open his eyes, say something, whatever, or cough, or whatever. And then people will say, he has revived. That's exactly, he was almost like that, but there was still life by God's grace, and then he came back. He almost lost his life, but he came back. That is revive. Then we, we read here uh, to uh, strengthen or establish the things which remains. That describes the spiritual condition of maybe someone here in this room. It's not hopeless, because you still can strengthen. That's the message, that's the beauty. There's, there's a problem, okay? This is not good. This is a bad condition, but there's hope. That's the message that Jesus said. Strengthen what remains. There's still a remain, okay? And, and it also says that it's a great danger. It's about to die. It's not too late. You see, nothing is hopeless. Nothing is too late. There is still 
a little bit, you can bring it back. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of God. The, the text should be read like this. I have found no works of yours fulfilled. I have found no works of yours fulfilled. And the word, the word fulfill uh, is a very interesting word. means level up, satisfy, accomplish, fulfill up. So before God's, in the God's side, before God's eyes, these works of ours, our actions that we do, we're supposed to do for Him, our ministries, or whatever we do as Christian that is supposed to be in the name of Jesus Christ, we can look at it in different ways. Many of us, we do something that may be incomplete. We start something, but we don't finish it. We don't have the heart to finish it. We start a class, Lord, I'm going to take this class because I want to be a disciple to, for evangelism or seeking Him or whatever. I will start, but how many people will fall before the end? Okay, we start something, but we don't finish uh, something. Um, you show up, you, you, your name is on a schedule for ushers, for the easy worship, for whatever it is. Your name is on the schedule. You will show up, you will fulfill that day, but there's no heart in it. There's not the best quality of your life because your name is on the schedule. I have to. Maybe a few Sundays you will not even show up to church, but the day that your name is on the schedule, you will come to do the, your duty, which is even worse. <laughs> it's like doing something superficially, but with not with the heart. Okay, another thing that we know, all of us here are quite intelligent people, I would say. Eh? We all have intelligence and abilities. We can all do something or anything with our natural abilities. About everything that is being done in the church weekly, we can do it with our natural abilities. Brother Stephen, can you play the guitar without being in the spirit? Yes, you can. Brother uh, XP plays, he's a, he's a professional. Uh, can you run the computer without doing it for God? Yes, because I've been, you know, using a computer since 1993. So I can run, run my mouse and everything. I can, I can do these things. Uh, can you be an usher and open the door and smile to someone? You know, you just wake up, get out of bed, you know, wash your face, you know, and then just show up, you know, on the time that the pastor says. You can do that. We can run easy worship without any passion for God because we know how to uh, run them uh, without any sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. You can play music without uh, the Spirit because you are good on an instrument. You can be a, a Sunday school teacher because you are good in telling stories. You are just a natural gift and you are naturally funny. You don't need the Holy Spirit to do that, okay? Uh, pastors, if we have been pastor long enough, I mean, we can just uh, get the newspaper and preach you a sermon next week, you know, from South China Morning Post. We can do anything. We have to decide if we're going to do it in the spirit or if we are just going to do it because we're getting good at it and we have to and all this without the heart. So your works have not been f filling up what God is expecting of that. It's not satisfying to the Lord. It's not measuring up uh, to that. The presence of work is not enough. You know why? And th this is very important. It's one of my main points. Don't miss it. Okay, Be, stay with me. Don't sleep. If you're someday sleeping, just wake him up right now. <laughs> the presence of work is not enough because God requires. And I repeat that. Because God requires that works done for Him will be done with a particular intent and purpose. If you are going to do something for God, show up at church and take, accept any responsibilities. God, not the pastors, of course we want it too because we, we, we want to honor God and we want the best for the church, but God Himself requires 
Uh, when you say, yes, I will do this task, that it will be done from your heart like it is for the Lord that you are doing. If you are going to buy something for the church to, to satisfy the needs of paper for the church, you do it. If you have to put the envelopes in the back, you do it. You do everything. If there is a paper on the floor, you pick it up. If there is a toilet that is, you know, overflowing, you, you go on the ground floor, you ask the management, give me the, the plunger. I have a, a work to do for the Lord. And we, we do these things. When the ushers say, today I'm not usher, so don't ask me anything. <laughs> it's not my day, it's not my schedule. I think there's a problem there. When you finish the kettle of hot water on the fourth floor, I don't know how many Sundays I'm so, I'm so, uh, I come to take hot water. The person before me or I just, just emptied it and did not refill it. To me, it's very offensive. It's, it's impolite. It's not, it's not considered. Something's not done. As, and, the, and the respect for one another, this is the church of God. We come here together. I mean, this is little things, but these little things are indication of a bigger things, our hearts, okay? Uh, I hear many times about the long black hair in the sink, in the toilet, or on the toilet seat, or, or sometimes urines on the seat, or something like this. It's being left by the person just before us. How is it? I wash the toilet seat every single Sunday that I come here. I take off the toilet paper every Sunday afternoon and I put it back in the things. I do it. And I'm, I'm happy to do it because somebody needs to do it. Somebody needs to do it because people are coming to church today. And if there is, if in the middle of the service you go to the toilet, there's no toilet paper anymore, then find somebody and replenish it because somebody else will be going there. You say, well, Pastor, you are away from your sermon. It's supposed to be spiritual <laughs> life. Okay, maybe I am, maybe I am. When the basic line is this, when you see any need for any reason at any time, this is the house of God. Today, the life of the Spirit it is supposed to move in each individual serving each other, bringing our spiritual gifts to serve. Isn't it what the Bible says? That my spiritual God, your spiritual gifts will serve one another, that everything that God has given us as gifts and talents are supposed to be for the benefits and the edification of the church. Isn't it what the Bible says? I'm just preaching what the Bible says, I think. Yes. But this is found, okay, when we preach a verse, everybody says amen. But then when the, the, this verse is going to be applied in a very little ordinary task of a day, then we don't know how to apply the Bible anymore. This is the funny thing. We all agree with the big doctrine, with the big teaching, but when it's time to put it in practice and the little things, then we are not available today, sorry. Works done for God must accomplish a spiritual work. It's a work by the Holy Spirit. It's been breathed upon. This, this mission, this task, this evangelism, uh, outreach, uh, the, the worship, anything that we will do in the name of God, is supposed to be breathed upon has come out of an inspiration that the Holy Spirit is giving. Uh, and we feel the excitement, the burden, and the, the heart of God inside of us so that we can go on with that. It's the life of the Holy Spirit. The medical mission can be a humanitarian uh, task or it can be an eternal soul-saving mission. We have a choice. We can go there and just give them medicine. And many, and I'm surprised, because many of the doctors that we have worked with through the years in the Philippines, they told us, you are the only group 
that, that, that is what I, I'm, I'm, we are not the only group. But the doctors that we have talked and have helped us, they says this is the first time that we go through a medical mission like this. Because we preach. From the morning to the end of the day, we preach. We preach, we pray. We console people. We have pastors. We take care of the spiritual life. My friend Andre that dances, before he will take a, a tooth of someone, before that, he gives the shot, okay? Then he has to wait for a few seconds. He lays his hand. He asks the person, may I speak with you? May I pray with you? And he prays with that person and he shares the message of the gospel with every single person patient throughout the day. If he sees 50, 75, 100, he will do it for all of them. That's what we do. Or we can just go there and just do humanitarian task. The actions may be right, but the motives may be are wrong or for the wrong reason. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep, keep it and repent it. Here the words and that Bible version says, remember what? But actually, if you look at King James, the Greek word, it says, remember how. It's not, not remember only what you have heard at first, but remember how you were responding to it when you receive it at first. How important, how life-changing it has been to you, and how shocked that you have been when you heard it. You know, I remember the message that I have heard when I was saved. I remember exactly the message. Seven months after I was a new Christian, I went to a, a mission. It was in my country, but it was a true, true mission. We went to the east coast of Quebec and in a place there. And in the morning, we had Bible studies, bilingual English and French. In the afternoon, we would go door to door. And at night, we would have uh, public meetings in the street. We've done it for every day for intensively for five weeks. I remember the teaching that I received into this the intensive Bible training. And do you know what? Most of the young people at the time who went to this school of ministry or whatever for five weeks, we are all missionary and pastors all over the world. Almost every single one of us to going through that. You know, this pastor was not even one of us. He was a pastor of an old established church in the city of Toronto. They are English speaking. And it was an old Pentecostal church, which could be very much dead like the city of Sardis could be. But instead, one day, him and his wife drove through the eastern part of Quebec, and they saw no evangelical church, not a single one. Everything was Catholic only. And they were really shocked. So they returned to their church, they fasted, they prayed. Then they came back and they bought a piece of land near the American Indian reservations and over there near a few cities, New Brunswick and Quebec on the border. And they started to bring uh, Bible school students from upstate New York in Toronto and, and Ontario, and then they would come and try to evangelize French-speaking people in Quebec who were Catholic. It didn't have a great success at first. And then after that, they started to reach out to our churches and ask our pastors at the time, would you send us young people to come? So then it became bilingual group. But everybody that joined in this group there, we are all alive in Christ and serving the Lord all over the world. And this pastor was not dead. He had a vision, and because of him, we are, in, we, we are serving God today. Hold fast. Keep the eyes upon it. Guard it. Prevent losing it. That's what it means, when hold fast to it. Repent. Do you realize that in the message of Christ to seven churches, the instructions or the command to repent is repeated five times? On seven churches, the message repent is five to five of them. That means something. These church had the reputation to be alive. These church was wealthy and well established. These church has all kinds of things going on for them. I know your works. One of these churches, your works 
are more than you used to before. So it's not a lack of activities and programs and nice buildings and money in the bank and all sorts of things like that that was the problem. But in all these church that seems to flow in our society like successful, doing things for God, having good reputation, Jesus Christ says to five of them, repent. Why? What's the problem? Nobody in the board of this church or in the lead spiritual leadership of this church saw the problem. But Jesus Christ saw it. How many times do you hear the message to repent addressed to you today? How many songs, modern worship songs, do you have today that will call you to repent. Like this week I was, I was listening to wonderful, upbeat, good songs. Like, and not like cheap songs, like good words. Like words that really talks about revival, send the rain, fill me, and all of this. And then suddenly it came very clear to me. Not one of them talks about fill me, I want the, the rain of the Holy Spirit, I want more of your life, God. But not one of them says, Lord, I repent because I, I have a problem. And if I want more of that rain, I need to repent first. Okay? No, it says, Lord, listen to the song. Now. Do it now. We need it now. Give it to me now. Lord, do it, Lord. I need it now. Do it now. But there is no uh, uh, words in all of these songs that says, Lord, we are in a mess we need you to rescue us. Please, we need to repent. You know the message of Second uh, Chronicle chapter 7? If my people who is called by my name humble and seek and repent and turn away from their evil, I will heal their land. That is the message of the Bible. This is the message of Revelation. This is the message for the church today. This is the message for Lighthouse. She says, oh, wow, oh, I didn't know it was really for Lighthouse. Do I really need to repent? Do we need to repent? Is there something we need to repent of? Yes. Or we are just okay like this and just go on? Okay, I don't know. You need to, to decide by yourself. I have things I need to repent. What does that mean to repent? Change your ways. Come back to me. That's, that's repenting. Like there's something that is not right with God, not pleading to the Lord. Get, deal with it. Change it. Repent. Change that. That's the message. Repent. Remember. Go back. Do you remember how it was? It's not like that. Then you need to repent. That's as simple as that. You've lost something. You need to repent to get it back. It, that, that's how repentance works. Repentance is not a negative word. Because it says, when you will repent, in the book of Acts chapter 4, I think, or 5, it says, when you repent, you will have times of refreshing. That's what, that's what it does. Amen? Amen? So that is really, really, really important. And uh, when it says uh, uh, repent in this text here, the word is do it fast, it's urgent, and without delay. That is another point that is really important. You know, we, I could shout here in your face, get blue, red, green, any color, try to convince you you need to repent. Okay, fine, so what? Then you go back, we eat food, we forget about the message today, and we go on next week. Pastor Jennifer will, oh no, we will have Christian, Brother Christian will be preaching next week, and there will be another message. And then for a week after that, probably Pastor Jennifer will be preaching. Oh, not the message. And at the end of the month, then maybe Pastor Rene or Pastor uh, Jennifer will be giving another message. We we'll just go on like this. But here it says, repent without delay. It's urgent. If you do not wake up. And that's why. Because if you do not wake up, there is going to be consequences. But if you do wake up, there's going to be consequences too. A positive consequence and a negative consequence. And the negative consequence is very terrible. I will come as a thief and you will not even be aware of it. 
that is very tragic because after this let this message it's the tribulation after it says repent it's urgent after the next picture the next portrait is what's going to happen in this world you don't want to miss that I don't want to miss that so we have a responsibility to respond to that I want to read um, something from Mr. Spurgeon. I think it's really good. I have a, 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 the, the, the slide, Mr. Spurgeon. And you will read it with me, okay? Because that is something about being revived that I think we, we will benefit from having it. So, can you read it over there? Yes. Yes, okay. Can we read from It Is Sorrowful, okay? It is a sorrowful fact that many who are spiritually alive greatly need reviving. It is sorrowful because it is the indication of much sin. A man in sound health does not need reviving. He requires daily sustenance. Sustained by gracious promises and enriched out of the fullness which God has treasured up in his dear son. Their soul should prosper and be in health, and they should need no reviving. They should aspire to a higher and richer blessing than a mere revival. They should earnestly cover the upper springs. They should be asking for growth and grace. They should have outsourced the period in which they need to be constantly crying, will that now revive us again. So, according to what you just read, praying for revival is already a sign of something negative, of, of a problem that is deep. Because we should have outsourced this need to always go back, r repenting and repenting and repenting again and praying for this. Because we should now, if we are in good health, we sh what, what we need is not to be revived like the, the, the dead man I give as an example in the river, and then you reanimate him because he's almost dead, and then you revive. No, according to Mr. Uh, Spurgeon here, uh, Pastor Spurgeon, if you are in health, what you need is not revival. Because you already revive, you're already alive. What you need is sustenance. You need food. You need spiritual, more spiritual life. You, you, you need to be sustained. You know, God has so much in the Holy Spirit given to us. Why should we always be down? Why should we always be lifeless? Why should we always be disconnected from God? And, and living in the flesh and doing things and you know, going back in a spin always. And when we have the riches of heaven... That the power of the Holy Spirit, we have everything that we need to be enriched with the fullness of God's treasures and His soul. Our soul should prosper and we should need no reviving. That's the goal. That's, that's, the, that's more the normal state. Okay? The church to Sardis is not the normal state. There's a problem, but God loves any, any people and He is tending his hand and bringing back up but the 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 desire of God or the Christian normal life should be that we nourish ourselves and that we live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit how many of you are baptized in the Holy Spirit how many of you spend time during the week to pray in other tongues how many of you covet the spiritual gifts how many of you use the speaking in tongues regularly or still continue to seek after that that is the Bible we want more we want more we don't want reviving Maybe we do, because the reality is many times uh, below what the standard is, what the goal is, what the intention and the plan of God is. We live below that. So we need reviving, okay? So it's not that we don't need. We need it. But ideally speaking, if we walk with the Lord as we ought to, we should not always be in need of reviving. We should seek 
more of the fullness, more love, more power, more evangelism, more Bible studies and learning, and more going out for God, more outreach and more fruits and all of this. We should aspire to a higher and richer blessing. That's the plan of God. Amen? Amen. I hope I'm not putting you down this morning or feeling down. I, I want you to, to see what God wants for us. That, that we have that in our heart. That we desire. That we seek after that. That we covet. Covet is a big word. Like we lost that. Uh, we, we want it more than anything else. We covet the upper springs. That's the plan of God. The Holy Spirit and everything. That we will grow, grow in grace. That is what God wants to do. Amen? I'm stopping here. I can go on. You know that, eh? But I'm stopping here because that's, I believe, what God has put on my heart for our church today. That God wants more than to revive us. He wants us to live in the fullness. Because He has fullness for us. Amen? Amen. Let us stand together.